Hello, everybody. Hello and welcome. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here with us this afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of both the Ford School and our co-sponsor, the International Policy Center. And it is a great honor for us to have the internationally renowned development economist with us, Jeffrey Sachs, who is here to deliver our 2010 Citigroup Foundation Lecture. The Citigroup Foundation Lecture Series is made possible from a gift from the foundation several years ago in honor of President Gerald R. Ford, our school's namesake and one of the university's most distinguished alumni. We're very grateful to the foundation for its generous gift, which has enabled us to bring so many distinguished policy leaders and thinkers to campus. And it is especially a great personal pleasure for me to welcome our speaker, Jeff Sachs, here with us today. I was a junior faculty member in Harvard's Department of Economics from 1984 to 1992, and throughout that time, Jeff was my senior colleague. And in, in many ways, he was a real inspiration for me and indeed for anyone launching a career in international or development economics. His classes were overflowing. Literally dozens of doctoral students were lined up to work with him. He was a prolific author, and increasingly world leaders were calling to solicit his policy advice. He was an economist who truly infused theoretical insights with practical engagement and with a passion to help people most in need. And he didn't just write and talk about economic development and public policy. He went out and he made a real difference for real people. As I've said, a true inspiration. So um, Jeff is now the director of the Earth Institute the Cadillac Professor of Sustainable Development and Professor of Health Policy and Management at Columbia University. He's Special Advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and President and Co-Founder of the Millennium Promise Alliance, a nonprofit organization aimed at, enter at ending extreme global poverty. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Sachs to the podium. Jeff? Susan, thank you so much for inviting me and for the nice words. And one more thing I would add to your introduction is that I'm a Michigander through and through. Uh, and uh, at Oak Park, 10 Mile Road. Uh, and uh, of course, it stays with you. And this university uh, is always uh, with me and in, in my heart. And it's our kind of family school. So it's wonderful to to be here and also very exciting to see many friends, classmates, colleagues, and I uh, thank you for the chance to, to be with you. It's interesting today that we're uh, starting uh, what should be a crucial global meeting, but is relegated uh, to the back pages of the newspaper. I'm referring to Cancun which is the meeting of the international signatories of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's the 16th such meeting since the Framework Convention went into uh, application, went into force in 1994. This is the world governing law for what will become one of the most pressing day-to-day -day realities on our planet in the years ahead and is already creating a tremendous amount of turmoil. And of course, I'm referring to the effects of climate change. And yet, how puzzling it is that as important as this issue is, the only time it really has gotten notice in the United States in recent months is to defeat some of the congressmen who voted for doing something about it. And almost all who were in Democrats in uh, marginal districts who voted for uh, the uh, legislation that passed the House a couple of years ago to cap carbon emissions were defeated in the November elections. And the 
politics was uh, already nearly impossible on this issue in the United States, but without question, November has made it uh, e even that much harder. And I'll show you in a, in a few minutes uh, some of the most recent survey data about the rather shocking American attitudes to this issue, which can best be described as, uh, as a lot of confusion. So we are starting a global meeting with almost no prospects of anything important coming out of it. And that has generally uh, been uh, an accurate way to describe events since the 18 years ago when the treaty was first signed in Rio in 1992 and the 16 years since it was ratified by enough of the signatories in 1994. The situation simply continues to get worse because the climate doesn't really care about our politics. Uh, it's not noticing. What it does care about is the rise in concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and those continue to rise fairly relentlessly. Even during our downturns, uh, the world's uh, increase of carbon emissions is stark and the dangers are growing. Now, there was an international meeting of the same ilk two weeks ago that didn't even make the back pages of our newspaper. You had to be a real specialist to notice how neglected it was. Uh, and that was a meeting in Japan, in Nagoya, on the Convention on Biological Diversity. That was another of the major environmental treaties signed 18 years ago in Rio. And that treaty, as its name suggests, is committed to first slowing and then ultimately halting, ideally, it can't be reversed, the extinction of species on the planet. We're in what the biologists call the sixth great extinction period of all Earth's history, the first one during the human period, and of course the first one in which a great extinction is caused by one of the species out of the 100 million or so that are on the planet. Uh, we're having devastating effects at profound threat to our well-being in countless ways and certainly uh, profound threats to uh, the planet and to uh, the ecosystems which direct life on the planet. Um, that meeting didn't even make it to uh, a brief mention of public consciousness. One of the problems is that the United States never even signed that treaty. In 1994, when we had an election not unlike the one we just experienced in November, uh, and there was the contract with America, uh, one of the uh, points of the contract was a contract on uh, the world species, um, and that was to uh, insist that the U.S. not ratify the Convention on Biological Diversity. It was viewed as a violation of private property rights, uh, and we never became signatory to it. And the convention, like much else that's agreed internationally, has had, I would say, essentially zero impact on slowing this mass extinction, though it has produced lots of scientific and documentary evidence of of what's happening. But we've not been able to tilt the needle in the slightest. And for this one, it's uh, absolutely shocking to me, since I watch close up at the UN, there actually was a goal, not just the general treaty goals, but a time-specific goal for the year 2010 that was set in 2002 for slowing the rate of biodiversity loss. Being at the UN uh, on a very frequent basis, I heard a lot, of, uh, a lot about that goal, since it was a UN objective or of the signatories to this treaty, but I never heard one word about it in casual conversation in the world in the eight years 
that it was supposedly in operation. Literally, not one person in the entire world ever asked me a question about it or made a statement about it unless I was talking to an ecologist uh, who happened to know. But it's another sign of what I want to talk about today, which is how blithely we are proceeding in the most extraordinarily dangerous manner on the planet. And it's not as if we're taking calculated risks. We're taking measures without the slightest interest in finding out what those risks might be and in almost complete neglect of uh, the, uh, not only the consequences of our actions, but the implications of our actions for uh, the planet and for ourselves and especially for our children uh, and generations that are going to come. So today is not a happy story, even though it's uh, well timed to the opening of yet another meeting. It's a somber tale of, uh, that ask the question, is there a way to do better? Can we find a way to thread the needle um, through a very complicated politics so that we begin to take some real actions? Fortunately, the answer is probably yes, but the evidence for that is negligible other than some assertions that I'm gonna make later in my talk. Uh, in other words, I'm gonna try to suggest some ways forward, not that uh, I think we're uh, all that far along on this. So what is sustainable development and uh, global sustainable development is, is really the right phrase. It is a basic challenge and that challenge becomes more and more pressing. It is how to combine the economic aspirations of the planet and for most of the world that means still achieving economic development in the first place uh, for the already uh, developed countries like the United States, it means not falling off the perch and hopefully still continuing to find a way forward. How to combine that basic powerful dynamic because economic growth is happening in the world and it's happening robustly and relentlessly even right through our current economic malaise, I'll indicate in a moment. How can this be combined with planetary sanity with respect to the Earth's ecosystems, the natural environment, and the shared biodiversity on the planet? It's two goals. We have a hard enough time in our country achieving any one goal these, at this moment. We're certainly not very good at achieving multiple goals. Sustainable development is really about achieving two very broad objectives. I usually define it as achieving three broad objectives, which is maintaining growth, helping to rescue the poor, and helping to save the planet from destruction. I'm gonna talk a little bit less about the poverty issues today, just say a word, but we can certainly discuss the issues of those who, despite the economic growth, are left behind uh, in uh, the discussion after my opening remarks. Suffice it to say, we're not even close to achieving this objective of sustainable development. If you're a student, I urge you to study it because you will have decades ahead of useful things to do, uh, and it is uh, one of the least solved problems on the planet, and it therefore combines urgency, intellectual fascination, uh, and uh, almost uh, open virgin territory for intellectual pursuits because we still lack any deep understanding of how we're going to actually accomplish these goals. And in almost no part of the world, save a few countries, perhaps, uh, exemplified by uh, the Scandinavian countries, which are more on track than any other part of the planet. Is this agenda properly engaged right now? In the United States, at best, we care about economic growth and have put the environment into uh, a very, very distant second place. 
this uh, picture is uh, the template from an important article that appeared in 2009 in Nature magazine where a group of about 25 of the world's leading ecologists got together in an expert review of the evidence to consider the environmental boundaries or thresholds that pose the greatest dangers for humanity and to try to begin to assess, because it was their very frank uh, acknowledgement that this was only an initial foray into defining what boundaries might be for these various uh, ecosystem threats. And if you go around the circle, though it's probably hard to see in, in the room, certainly in the back, these are issues like climate change, which is the one that I'll focus on today, ocean acidification, which is another crucial and independent result of the carbon emissions from fossil fuel burning. It is the fact that with the rising carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean and is already acidifying the ocean with tremendous risk to the marine ecosystems and especially to all of the marine species with exoskeletons and, and uh, the diatoms that are part of the food chain. Going around the circle uh, clockwise from uh, 12 uh, noon, uh, which is climate change, then ocean acidification, there's ozone depletion, uh, which you're aware of and is one of the few areas where real progress was made because that was a case where one specific human technology, chlorofluorocarbons were the predominant or maybe the exclusive cause of the human made or anthropogenic ozone depletion and where it was possible to find a safe substitute. And so it was a rather straightforward technical substitution of one set of chemicals for another which over the long term will actually reverse the ozone depletion that was very far underway by the 1970s when this result was first discovered. Incidentally, and I'll allude to it later on, when the ozone depletion effect was first known, the companies that were producing the chlorofluorocarbons, of course, went to town calling it a hoax, a fraud, a myth, and every conceivable thing that they could call it exactly what they do with human-induced climate change today. And then one of their scientists uh, tugged on the CEO's uh, uh, sleeve and said, by the way, we have a substitute, at which point they came out and said, now everybody has to adopt solutions. This is very important. Uh, yes, and so forth. So, so much is driven by, uh, by the corporate uh, propaganda, and that was uh, definitely one of the uh, clearest examples of that, going from delay and obfuscation to a quick solution once a technical uh, means was found and then the, those who had the technology in hand could argue for uh, the solution. Still moving uh, clockwise, uh, the next category that you see in bright red because it really is a drama already is nitrogen flux. We have seven billion people on the planet. This is ten times more than when Thomas Malthus wrote pessimistically about the principles of population in 1798, two centuries ago, at which point there were about 750 million people on the planet. Malthus said we wouldn't be able to support uh, a rise of population or an increase of living standards because any increase of living standards would quickly get dissipated by higher population, but that would be limited by food productivity. We broke through the food constraint, certainly far from perfectly, even in nutrition for feeding 7 million people, 7 billion people, but we actually did not break through the environmental constraint, though we think we have, because in order to produce enough food for 7 billion people, we have to put on about 150 million tons of chemical fertilizer every year, roughly 100 million metric tons of nitrogen every year. And that massive deposition of nitrogen is one of the most destructive 
human-induced changes on the planet. As I'm sure most of you are aware, we have a 200-mile-long dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. As the Mississippi River accumulates, the runoff of that nitrogen, the leaching, from all of the farmlands of 25 to 30 states in the Midwest carries it down to the Gulf and creates the eutrophication phenomenon, the hypoxia, and the dead zone. It's now been realized that about 130 estuaries around the world are similarly turning hypoxic, short of oxygen because of eutrophication. And we're seeing, therefore, one of the most important ecosystems in the world, the estuar estuarine ecosystem, which mixes the fresh water and, and uh, the seawater uh, at, uh, at, at the outlets of uh, freshwater uh, rivers around the world being destroyed. Nobody has an answer to this right now, incidentally, just to cheer you up. Organic farming doesn't change any of the nitrogen budget, it just changes where you get the nitrogen from. There are certainly ways to use nitrogen more efficiently, but the basic fact of feeding 7 billion people is a very tough nut to crack. And in this sense, while we are feeding adequately, maybe not adequately, but feeding systematically roughly six of the seven billion people and the other billion are struggling every day to have enough to survive. We're not doing it in an environmentally sustainable manner and so far there are no adequate solutions to that. Right next to it is the phosphorus cycle which we're similarly deranging because it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium which are the three macronutrients that have to be added through chemical uh, and organic fertilizers. Moving right along, and I uh, won't belabor uh, all the point, is the fresh water crisis, the changes of land use, the next, next bright red cone uh, that you see is the biodiversity loss where there is a fulminant and almost entirely neglected disaster underway. It makes sense if there are seven billion of us on the planet and we're eating and we're clearing farmland and pasture land to do it, we are commandeering literally the land and the food supply that would feed the other species on the planet. And the best estimates, which I still find uh, shocking to, to contemplate, is that our one species commandeers about 40 to 50 percent of the total net primary productivity of photosynthesis on the planet. That's a lot. We're taking almost half of the total photosynthetic potential of the planet for us. We're doing it through pasture lands that we cleared for our meat production. We're doing it by the croplands, obviously, uh, to grow. We're doing it by, uh, through the asphalt surfaces uh, that uh, build our cities. Uh, and in total, we're literally pushing the other species, not only out of their habitats, but uh, right out of, out of existence. And that one is, uh, according to the ecologists, uh, the, the most uh, dramatic and imminent of all of the threats. The next one, uh, now we're roughly at 9 o'clock, between 9 and 10, uh, is the atmospheric aerosol loadings. That's the soot. Uh, and the, uh, the dark carbon cloud over much of Asia. Uh, for those who have been in China recently, there is, as far as I know, not a major city in China where you can actually see sunshine uh, for uh, more than perhaps a few days out of the year. Uh, so polluted are the cities through the carbon, uh, through the coal burning, uh, and that's creating this massive uh, aerosol loading. Of course, sulfur oxides and other aerosols are also part of it. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, one is the chemical pollutants. Also, it says not yet quantified. They're pervasive and they're polluting major rivers and major cities all over the world, including, again, most of China's huge cities. The conclusion of the ecologists was dramatic. Of course, they were writing mainly for other scientists and other ecologists but they were saying that thresholds can be identified and we're very close to them. 
those points at which you achieve, you arrive at huge and perhaps uh, amplifying instability and irreversibility. For climate change, if you look at the, uh, uh, the bullseye there, uh, only three of the five uh, parts of that cone are shown. Uh, this is right at the top. So they were suggesting that there still is some room before we pass the ultimate climate change threshold. My colleague at the Earth Institute, our lead, actually our, we have two lead climate scientists, Jim Hansen and Wally Broker. Uh, Jim Hansen being NASA's lead scientist on, uh, on clim the Earth's climate system and NASA has at Columbia University a unit called the Goddard Institute of Space Studies which Dr. Hansen heads. Hansen, through reliance not only on the formal modeling and the uh, satellite evidence that he and his colleagues have developed, but also extraordinary work in reading the paleoclimate record, looking at how carbon dioxide has been associated with temperatures millions of years ago by looking at various isotopic signatures of temperature and carbon concentrations, has made a very strong assertion that we're past the threshold. So just to cheer you even less. We are, as we measure the uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, at 387 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It means for every million molecules of carbon dioxide, 387 of those molecules are carbon dioxide. Doesn't sound like very much. Uh, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the atmosphere, but it is enough, first of all, to keep us alive because without the effect of carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases, the planet would be fro a frozen wasteland. So there's a good side to the greenhouse gases. But the change, even that modest change from 280 parts per million, the pre-industrial level, to today's 300 or last year's recently documented 387 parts per million is enough to have raised the Earth's temperature on the direct land measurement uh, record as of now by about 0.8 of one degree centigrade. But once the full feedbacks work through, perhaps two or three times that. And what Hansen has shown dreadfully, is that whenever the Earth has been above this 350, or I'm sorry, this uh, been above a threshold which he has characterized as 350 parts per million, the oceans have been 10 to 30 meters higher than they are today. In other words, we've passed the threshold that in the geological record is sufficient to melt the great ice sheets. And Hansen's claim is that we're already seeing the disintegration of the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets. And we don't know whether this is a matter of decades or thank God this isn't going to happen for 200 years till we wreck the planet or maybe 400 years, but that the paleoclimate record is actually quite powerful. And Hansen's basic point is that there is a powerful positive feedback system of the climate on the planet so that even small perturbations, modest changes, are tremendously amplified. And one of the main amplifiers is the disappearance of the ice cover itself on the sea ice and the glaciers and the, uh, and the ice sheets uh, of Antarctica and Greenland because as the ice melts, the Earth loses its reflectance, uh, its so-called albedo, and therefore more of the solar radiation is absorbed rather than simply reflected back into space. And this is one of the powerful feedbacks. There are probably many others, including the ocean's degassing of carbon dioxide as they warm, kind of as you warm your Coca-Cola, the 
the bubbles come out, and the permafrost uh, under the, uh, the uh, Siberian tundra, for example, releasing methane as it warms from the uh, peat that is then exposed. So there are, Hansen says, if unless we find ways not just to stabilize as we're trying to do at 450 or some scientists say maybe 550, but actually stabilize and bring it down over the next decades or century, the consequences for sea level and consequently for uh, the, the entire uh, population dynamics uh, of the world, uh, given the high concentrations of uh, societies uh, uh, around the world near the coast, could be devastating. What it actually means is everyone's moving to Ann Arbor uh, uh, from, from the coastline. So save a place for your neighbors. Uh, millions are going to have to uh, move in soon. So this is uh, one of Hansen's uh, maps. I, it's some, some, uh, somewhat familiar, I'm sure, to most or all of you. The basic point is that there isn't a part of the world uh, that isn't uh, affected. And the main thing I would just want to leave at this moment as I go on uh, is the fact that to the climate scientists, this debate about whether climate science is real or not is so far from the reality of the science as to be unintelligible and unimaginable to them. There are so many profoundly consistent reasons for knowing this relationship that the issues are not discussed at all in the way that the public seems to think and the Wall Street Journal insists they're discussed. And that is that it's been known for about 140 years that carbon dioxide absorbs infrared radiation and warms the planet. This is actually not 140, 180 years uh, since uh, Fourier uh, worked this out in the 1830s and 1840s. The basic carbon dioxide effect has been understood for 115 years since uh, Arrhenius, uh, the Nobel laureate Swedish chemist of the late 19th century, actually made by hand remarkably accurate calculations of what the carbon dioxide doubling would actually mean for the planet and he got it right in the zone that the most sophisticated models understand today. The science at the basic level is not in doubt, and the paleoclimate and current ecological and satellite readings and a profound range of other kinds of data and evidence all point unequivocally in the direction of anthropogenic change. What's in doubt is the magnitude, the pacing, the timing, but not the basic science itself. And the, the, the areas of agreement are powerfully strong and the evidence overwhelming and the public continuing to doubt it. And finally, uh, this uh, graph is uh, emphasizing, uh, as the World Wildlife Foundation uh, does each year as it publishes uh, this index, that the species abundance of every major class of species is in significant decline right now. And of course, you've all read about the catastrophes of the pollinators, the catastrophes of the amphibians, the catastrophes of the corals, and so on. Major classes of species under threat because of the human forcings. Now, it all is tending to get a lot worse fast. And that's because of something that generally we consider very good news and that I have spent a lot of my career trying to help promote, and that is economic growth in the poorer countries. We're living in a quite remarkable period, not remarkable in the way we're feeling it in the United States, but remarkable as it's being felt in the rest of the world. The rest of the world outside of Europe and the United States has no idea there's an economic crisis right now, except by hearing the speeches of 
the U.S. president or uh, a uh, or, or uh, the prime minister of uh, of Greece uh, uh, or or of Ireland, because in the rest of the world, economic growth is robust and at historic highs, and that's actually true now even in more and more of the poorest places in the world. We're experiencing a phenomenon that economists call economic convergence. And that is a tendency for poorer countries to be able to narrow the proportionate income gap with richer countries by being able to absorb technologies that are the difference of living standards in essence. And so by being able to adopt uh, and uh, adapt to some extent technologies already in use in the high-income countries, today's poorer countries are able to jump ahead and enjoy economic growth rates, that is the change of real gross national product, at faster rates than ever before in human history. And of course, China is the headline exemplar of that. It is the most extraordinary period of economic growth in the history of the world. Since Deng Xiaoping opened China to international trade and to markets in 1978, that country has averaged 10% per year economic growth. That's extraordinary because compound growth is extraordinary and compound growth at 10% per year for what is now uh, 32 years is absolutely remarkable. So if you make the calculation, uh, you get from 1978, every uh, seven years is a doubling of the Chinese economy. And so if you do this for now, uh, this period from 1978 to uh, 2010, uh, 32 years, you double, 32 years is, uh, is, is five doublings. Uh, and so we're at the roughly a 30-fold increase of China's aggregate economy during this period. And of course, we're feeling it. And we're feeling it in some heavy ways as well. It's, in my view, having profound implications for our income distribution in the United States and especially making it impossible to make a living anymore in this country, in the middle class, unless one has at least a bachelor's degree because the competition through trade and through the flows of capital uh, with the uh, uh, lower wages uh, in developing countries of Asia and now a spreading part of the world are simply so large and powerful that they're having massive effects within the United States economy not all of my colleagues agree on this, but my, my perception is that this is very, very big. But whatever it's doing for us, what it's doing for the rest of the world is a massive surge of economic growth, unprecedented in history. And this is, I found, a quite telling map uh, of the International Monetary Fund for 2010. The dark blue countries are the ones that are experiencing economic growth of above 5% per year. Now, mind you, 5% per year is a doubling time of only 14 years, and many of these countries are growing at 8 or 10% per year. Then are the, uh, the light blue areas, which includes the United States, Canada, uh, uh, parts of uh, Central Europe, Australia, and so on, which are growing between 2 and 5% per year. We're barely in that category, maybe at about 2.5% growth right now in 2010, of an extraordinarily weak recovery that we're experiencing from a very deep downturn. Then are the countries in pink, which are the Western European countries, which are actually positive growth between 0 and 2%. In fact, per capita growth in Europe is the same as in the United States because population growth in Europe is almost a percentage point lower than in the U.S. So once you take into account population growth, we're both basically uh, growing at uh, something like 1%, 1.5% 1 
uh, per year. Very, very uh, slow given the preceding downturn. And there are only a couple of countries uh, in the world that are experiencing negative growth right now. What's striking about this is essentially the two-speed map of the world. The developing world said goodbye to us and our recession. When the downturn hit in the United States, everybody assumed there would be no decoupling, to use the, uh, the phrase at the time, uh, that the developing countries would experience an even more severe downturn. I actually doubted that at the time. I was wrong in a way because right after the financial collapse of Lehman Brothers, everybody went into a steep downturn because that was a panic. But once the panic subsided, the poorer countries came surging back in a way that the richer countries did not. And I think that this is actually par for the course. If you look at the annual growth rates, the green at the top here is the so-called emerging and developing economies. And they're growing now at, oh, 6%, 7% per year since the beginning of the past decade. The developed countries, which means the United States, Western Europe, Japan, and a handful of others, not only had the very deep downturn, minus three in 2009, but the recovery is very modest, and the spread is about four or five percentage points per year right now. In my view, that is a structural gap, not a temporary gap. The structural gap is essentially the convergence process. It might not remain so large, but I think that it is fairly safe to say that unless the world falls apart in one way or another, the poorer countries have a fairly wide running room of rapid growth because they're much poorer than the rich countries. Their average income is perhaps a tenth of the income of the rich world. And that means there's a lot to grow into by absorbing the higher uh, productivity technologies of the rich economies. And that's what's giving this fuel of growth. Without question, the most uh, dramatic example of that convergence these days is mobile telephony and wireless broadband, which has reached every impoverished village in the world just about by now. There are around 6 billion mobile subscribers. Five years ago in Africa, where we were working on projects in about a dozen uh, villages in a dozen countries in Africa, nobody had a phone. And none of these villages had fixed lines or wireless coverage. As of today, every one of them has wireless coverage. And it's typical in an extremely impoverished place that maybe 20% of the households would actually have a phone. And there are many aspects to that. The ingenuity of being able to sell phone by the seconds uh, so that you prepay and are able to buy tiny bits have brought this technology in a very ingenious way to the poorest people of the world. But the productivity advances that come from this, from having a village that was completely isolated had no news, had no idea about markets, couldn't make any business arrangements, where literally if you were a pastoralist community, you might trek for two weeks to take your camels or your goats or your sheep to a market, guessing, should I go up to the Red Sea? Should I go to Nairobi? Should I go to uh, some other port? And you'd get there and not know, and now you flip out the phone, as the pastoralists are doing all over East Africa and they're calling their markets and finding out what to do, and they're doing their banking online as well. Well, this is a great thing. It is a fuel, obviously, for economic development. But it's also a problem when you come back to sustainable development. Roughly put, think about it this way. There are 7 billion people on the planet right now, 6.9, but who's counting? Uh, and the average income is about $10,000 per person using what economists call a purchasing power adjusted standard where you adjust each country's income level according to their specific average price level. 
you add up the incomes across the world, it comes out to around $70 trillion, $10,000 on average per person, and 7 billion people. Suppose that the whole world just caught up to the rich world income. So the rich world's at $40,000 per capita on average. The world average is 10,000. If there were complete convergence, that would mean a fourfold increase of economic activity on the planet. That's what convergence has potentially to close. Add in the fact that the population of the world is continuing to grow and actually grow rather significantly even though the proportionate growth rate is slowing. We're still adding 75 to 80 million people net population increase each year, though now all in the poorer countries. You combine this force of convergence with the extra roughly 40% increase of the world's population that demographers are guessing could be the level at which the world population stabilizes as fertility rates come down to replacement. In other words, stabilization at around 9 billion as opposed to today's 7 billion. Combine those two forces and you see that we have built into the global dynamics right now an increase of total economic activity over the course of a century, say, that could amount to five or six-fold increase. And the point to keep in mind is that not only are those forces underway and much to be prized and praised in a lot of ways, but even today, we're unsustainable in what we're doing. So there's a collision, at least if we continue to do things the way we're doing them now. And this collision is an enormous one. It's the biggest thing humanity's ever faced because we've never before faced a truly global challenge like this. Throughout human history until now, our challenges have essentially been local or regional. Many, many civilizations have collapsed, as we know from Jared Diamond and others, because of ecological shocks or natural climate change or unsustainable practices. But never before has the planet as a whole in an interconnected manner been unsustainable at the baseline and then having built within it this massive increase of further anthropogenic forcings, as we would say, of human-induced changes on the planet. I took for this picture, just to show you, a simple standard economic model of convergence. So economists estimate lots of uh, statistical equations of how fast economies grow as they're catching up. And essentially, uh, an economy that is half the way to the frontier tends to grow at about one and a half percentage points faster than the frontier economy. An economy that is a quarter of the way to the leadership, one fourth, say, of the US level, would tend to grow three percentage points faster. An economy that is one eighth the level of the United States would grow about 4.5 percentage points faster according to the standard statistical models. If you plug that into the world as it is today and just churn this difference equation forward for another 40 years to mid-century, you find something like this graph that the world economy has built into it something on the order of a tripling of output by the middle of the century. That's not crazy. That's pretty plausible because it's implying a growth rate of the developing countries of today of something close to 5% per year. They're actually achieving even higher than that. So this is not a wild forecast. It's a, even a little bit cautious, one would say. 
except that it can't happen on our current technological trajectory. Something would have to give because what's not built into the economist standard model are the environmental implications of all of this growth. When I studied macroeconomics in 1972 for the first time and learned the canonical growth model that we're all weaned on, written by Robert Solow uh, in 1956 and which brought him his well-deserved Nobel Prize, that model says that economic output depends on human labor and on uh, capital stock and on any technology that we come up with and the technology is uh, just assumed to uh, somehow descend upon uh, our uh, fertile minds uh, and uh, the capital and the labor are more under our control. But what Professor Solow didn't deem to put in the model, though he was one of the leaders of amending his model later, was anything about the natural environment or the resource limits. And the reason is that as he always emphasized, you make strategic assumptions as an economist to simplify your models to get to points that are important. And as of 1956, these boundary conditions of the environment weren't important. And Solow chose right. He got a, one, uh, a first order differential equation. Thank goodness, so all his students for four generations to follow could solve it. And we all felt excited and good about that. And it inspired us to become economists. But the fact of the matter is that if you were writing a growth model today, you could never or should never dream of putting on paper such a model because now the boundary constraints are not second order concerns. They're not footnotes for com completeness. They are going to be the essential question for humanity even if Fox News and Wall Street Journal and all the rest of our media haven't figured it out yet. That's deeply embedded in the realities of population, convergent economic growth, and ecosystem realities. And the only question is how and when we catch up to this basic reality. One of the things it will mean of course, is that the United States, which has had a very unusual run of things, of course, especially becoming by far the predominant economy of the 20th century, after two world wars not fought on our soil, uh, and with, by virtue of uh, mass immigration of, uh, of genius, uh, partly as a result of those wars, and our own uh, cleverness uh, and uh, bounty of natural resources, we became, for our, we don't know whether it's our Andy Warholian 15 minutes of uh, historic fame or not, we became the world's leading economy. But what we can say pretty clearly is that that lead is shrinking already right now in relative terms because leadership is a relative phenomenon. It doesn't mean we have to suffer it does mean that our star in the sky won't shine quite as bright in the presence of other stars in the sky. And as everybody has come to appreciate, China will become a larger economy than the United States within the next 20 years. Not higher per capita income, but given a four time larger population, a larger overall economy. And that is affecting every bit of geopolitics Every single country I've been in, uh, well, I don't know if that's true, but almost every, and I would, that's dozens, by the way. Uh, but in the last dozen countries that I visited in the last five days, it feels like, but uh, in, in the last uh, three or four months, I've heard the same line. Oh, by the way, China just became our largest trading partner. This is amazing when you hear it in Santiago in Chile, for example when you hear it all through Africa. In Asia, you'd expect it, but it's a worldwide phenomenon. And this, of course, is part of uh, geopolitics, but it also should be informing us in a little bit more clever way about how we engage in the world right now. What this graph shows is just using that same simple 
uh, numerical model that I used to make the previous slide, that the U.S. share of the world economy won't disappear, will still be a big and outsized economy, but will go from being something like 20% of the world's population, uh, world's uh, uh, gross uh, product per year, to being something uh, closer to about uh, 13% by the middle of the century. Not precipitous unless we collapse, uh, but uh, definitely a decline. The red line on the top, the red curve, is the share of the developing countries in the world. Right now, they're about half of the world economy. The US, Europe, Japan, that's about half. And then the rest of the world is the other half in terms of total output. Now, that means that the rich world on average is still six, eight times richer uh, than, uh, than the poor by these metrics because uh, the uh, income level of the developing countries uh, in this categorization, which is the IMFs, the developing countries have a population of six billion and the rich world one billion. So we're sharing the world's economy, but with one-sixth of the population of uh, the other half of the planet. Now, what does this mean for climate change? It definitely means a mess, and it means a set of basic calculations of what we need to do. So let's look to the middle of the century and think about the, what the climate scientists are telling us. Now, according to Jim Hansen, he's telling us it's finished. Uh, we're already in disaster. Most climate scientists are telling us, please, please, please try to stabilize at 450 parts per million or less. Hansen says, not anywhere close to good enough. Our current trajectory is to reach 550 parts per million by mid-century and then shoot right through that limit and that almost surely would be catastrophic, and I want to underscore the word catastrophic. Devastating for hundreds of millions or billions of people around the planet. So what the cent central view of this is, is that at a minimum, we have to cut by half the world's emissions of greenhouse gases by the middle of the century compared to where we are today. That's tough. We're emitting 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year through energy use and another few billion tons through deforestation each year. That energy-led carbon emission should come down to perhaps 15 billion tons at the most. But that has to be done in the context of a burgeoning world economy. That's the challenge. It's an unprecedented challenge. If we need, or if the developing countries are counting on three times the world's output through their rapid growth, emissions should be half of today then emissions per unit of GNP, which is pretty constant around the world, by the way, because we all use basically the same technologies. So the emissions per unit of GNP is pretty much shared. That would have to come down to around a sixth of what it is right now. We'd have to be able to get our carbon dioxide emissions down to one-sixth per dollar of our income if the world is to have a chance of getting on a trajectory that isn't going to blow the whole world out of the water, or into the water, I should say. And that means reducing something like 83% uh, of our emissions intensity by 2050. Now, how could this conceivably be done? Obviously, there are lots of mixes and matches and Larry Burns, uh, your professor here and a colleague of mine uh, in the uh, program at the Earth Institute as well, we're discussing some of those options and playing with some of the numbers to try to see how this can possibly match. But one way, for example, 
would be a combination of energy efficiency combined with decarbonization of the energy system. And in some sense, both of these are vital. We have to get more output per unit of energy input, and we know there's lots of waste. As Larry uh, has emphasized so often, only 1%, if I have it right, of the energy that's used in an automobile actually is literally doing the work to carry the individual from one place to the next. Much of it is purely lost in, in uh, heat dissipation, and a lot of it is carrying the uh, other 3,000 pounds around that are accompanying us on our personal mobility. And so there's lots of room for saving energy through smarter vehicles, for example, and of course through uh, better design of homes and through smarter grids and so on. So one possibility is reducing the energy input per unit of output, but it's not so easy because the physicists are absolutely right that on, you need energy to do work, and you need work to make income, and you need uh, income to uh, have uh, the kind of living standards that the world aspires to. So the other part of this is to find ways to decarbonize the energy supply. Now what might be done in the U.S. context? How could this actually be accomplished? I'll use round numbers. We have six billion tons of carbon emissions in the world. Note that that is one-fifth of the world's total emissions of 30 billion tons. So GT, if for any of those who can see the, the graph, is gigatons, 30 billion tons of CO2 that are emitted by the burning of coal, oil, and natural gas. The U.S. is six of 30, we're a fifth. Now, mind you, we are 5% of the world's population emitting 20% of the world's emissions, so we're four times the average per capita emissions on the planet. Of those emissions from fossil fuel use, oil, gas, and coal all play their important role. Coal's about 2.1 billion tons, oil 2.5 billion tons, natural gas 1.4 billion tons of emissions. Now, what we could expect economically is that the U.S. economy will roughly double in size between now and 2050. That's taking as given some slowing down of our underlying growth rate to a pure per capita growth of about 1% per year, which I think is a realistic assumption, plus a population growth that will take us uh, to, uh, by mid-century to, I don't remember the number exactly, so don't hold me to it, but so, somewhere uh, uh, probably close to about 350 million Americans compared to 310 million today. So if our GNP or gross domestic product doubles and we are able to double our energy efficiency, as a rough measure we could say that perhaps we can get by with the current amount of energy use. That's probably the case if we make a huge effort at energy efficiency. We can't save energy net most likely compared to today in a growing economy at this rate, but we could probably hold the line. That's not good enough though if we're going to reduce emissions. That would just stabilize emissions. For that we have to change the way we use energy and roughly get to one-third of the carbon emissions per unit of energy that we have now. That is not an easy thing to do. But that's the scale of the challenge, and this kind of scale of challenge is what every country in the world faces. You can see why it's so easy to throw up your hands and say, forget it. Let someone else worry about it, because it is not easy at all to accomplish this. Can it be done? Well, if you look at the proportions of our energy use right now, about 40% of our total primary energy comes from petroleum. That's our oil import dependence. Another quarter roughly comes from coal, almost all domestic. Another quarter from gas, 
and then roughly one seventh from renewables or, or nuclear. So it's a hydro, nuclear, a little bit of biomass, and so forth. We'd have to change the mix and change how we use the energy in order to be able to get to a reduction to one-third of, uh, of our current emissions. Now, part of the mix can be changed, if possible, by moving from coal to natural gas. Natural gas, as you know, burns cleaner. Coal is essentially all carbon with uh, a little bit of hydrogen attached, whereas natural gas is a carbon with four atoms of hydrogen attached. When methane or natural gas is combusted, you get water and carbon dioxide as part of your energy mix. When coal is combusted, you just get the carbon dioxide. So you get roughly, not quite twice, the carbon dioxide per unit of energy from coal as you do from natural gas. Converting to gas would be one way to reduce the amount of U.S. emissions, but it would only take us a very small way. It wouldn't take us to a reduction of two-thirds. It would take us to a reduction of maybe 15 to 20 percent in total. It's no solution overall, though possibly it can add to the mix. The other part surely is moving to renewable or low carbon energy sources. Nuclear, solar, wind, or using fossil fuel and capturing the carbon and safely storing it geologically, what's called carbon capture and sequestration. Another popular idea, though not very popular with me, it remains to be proved, is biofuels. The problem with biofuels, which we've embarked on in a big way, is that they are competing directly with land. Land that should be used for food and land that should be used for nature. And photosynthesis is probably just not a good enough way to, uh, you, to uh, fuel our economy, and the idea that we're going to get a lot out of biomass, in my view, is still an unproven proposition. Perhaps not wrong, but I remain to be convinced. Well, if we moved from 14 percent to 50 percent of the energy mix to non-carbon, we'd start to get there. But how could this be done? It would mean drastically curtailing our use of oil, of course. Uh, and it would mean uh, using the fossil fuels in different ways. Larry, who was here and, and had to leave, was, as many of you uh, may know, uh, the lead of the project, which is today's headlines in the Detroit News, uh, the Chevy Volt. Uh, he was uh, GM's vice president for product development and research and development, and made one of the most consequential contributions, which is a pathway from, uh, from uh, an oil-based fleet of automobiles to an electric or fuel cell, also electric, uh, but a grid or fuel cell-based fleet of vehicles in the future. If you can do that and power the grid with clean primary energy sources, then one can begin to make a huge dent in this energy mix. So there are lots of choices that are at least potential. Nuclear, wind, solar, carbon capture and sequestration, possibly biomass, conversion to electric vehicles, conversion from uh, home and uh, building furnaces to electric uh, heating uh, driven by heat pumps industrial fuel cells at large industrial scale, and so forth. Lots of possible technologies. But there's a huge problem, which is why we've done essentially none of it yet. We have to decide we want to do it, because all of this is more expensive than what we're doing right now, which is just burning coal and using the electricity the cheap way. It is the case that the highest carbon emitting 
energy source is also the world's most plentiful and also the cheapest to use. And so the world is actually more and more moving towards coal, even though that's moving away from a solution to the climate change crisis. And the world's leading economy that depends on coal, of course, is China, where about 80% of the electricity is coal-fired and where 50% of the overall primary energy is coal. Un unbelievable, the implications of that in such a rapidly growing economy. It has meant that in a short period of time, China has overtaken the United States even though it's only half the size of our economy, it's overtaken the United States in total emissions. China's the number one leading emitting country in the world. And the, not per capita, of course, it's one-fourth of the U.S. per capita because it's four times the population and roughly the same emissions. But it is the leading emitter because it is such a coal-dependent economy and the amount of coal that it's adding every year, even as it looks to other fuels as well, is staggering and threatening to the entire planet. So the same set of calculations that I'm about to mention briefly here, definitely and even more importantly, are necessary in China and within a decade or two will be vital for India and for Asia in general, which is more than half the world's population and soon will be more than half or half at least of the world's total uh, GNP or total uh, world product. The problem is that we're going to have to pay an extra price. Now, why would we do this? To avoid the even greater ecological devastation. And the cost-benefit analysis is pretty clear, at least if you have a time horizon of 40 years. If you have a time horizon of 100 years and you actually think we have some responsibility to generations uh, in the next century, it's unequivocal because the current trajectory is so devastating that any sense of risk would cause us to have a massive change. The problem is that we've not come to accept that, and our political cycle is obviously with the time horizon inevitably of two years to the maximum. That's on election day. And the day after election day, the time horizon is two years minus one day, and the countdown is relentless. And we're already in presidential election season and uh, we've uh, barely blinked, and I don't think that President Obama has even finished filling his team yet for the first administration before he's got a full-fledged effort of running for re-election. So how much is this likely to cost? Here, some basic uh, calculations suggest the following, and I think this is really the, the, the main point. To make the kind of transformation that we would need to get to one-sixth of emissions can be done with known technologies or with technologies that are at a near commercial scale. Those technologies will improve over time as we learn from actually implementing. There's probably nothing that needs to be done that isn't at least on the drawing board, the mock-up, or the demonstration scale by now. The electric vehicles, the heat pumps, the greener buildings, the fuel cells, the solar, the wind, the nuclear are all there, and the one that is consequential that's not yet tested, but all its pieces are tested, is the carbon capture and sequestration. The big question there is both cost and geologic availability of reliable storage sites. But the evidence is, the more one looks at it, that the costs of making this transformation are within actually rather low bounds. 
but that the transformation is decades long to make because the power plants, the vehicle fleet, the buildings last for decades. What would be expensive is to knock everything down and try to start over, impossible. What is not prohibitively expensive is to roll out the old stuff and roll in the better stuff. And the difference in cost looks to be something on the order of $50 to $100 per ton of CO2 avoided. Now, if it's $50 per ton and we have to avoid 4 billion tons of it, we're talking about an annual cost on the order of about $200 billion a year. Small stuff with what they play with in Washington. That currently is about 1. Point, what is it? 1.35% uh, of GNP. So it's between 1 and 2% of GNP. If instead you allow for the energy efficiency as well and still assume that high price, not abate, not declining over time, you'd get to something by the middle of the century that would be well under 1% of GNP. And indeed, if you phase in this transition, you could stay less than 1% of GNP through the entire transformation process. And this, I think, really is the bottom line of the reality. We can lose the planet because we don't want to do this, or we can decide to invest something a little bit less than 1% of our income each year. Given that we're America these days, I don't know what we're going to decide. But as rational human beings who care for ourselves and for our children, I think the choice is pretty obvious when it's laid out clearly. Now, I ah, can't go through all of that. But let me say the following. There are probably fairly clever, low intrusive ways to do this, much better than the ways that have been proposed in Washington and have so far been rejected by Washington till now. And the way that I'm roughly proposing this without going into all of the gory details is to give an incentive for new low carbon producers by subsidizing the gap between essentially their current higher cost and the cost of coal and guaranteeing that subsidy out for a period of 25 years each year on a rolling basis as new producers bring clean technology online. Now how would you pay for that? Since we start out with essentially a coal, gas, and oil economy, if you put a tiny tax, oh, sorry, if you put a tiny tax on coal, oil, and gas, and then you give a pretty robust subsidy, five cents a kilowatt hour, six cents a kilowatt hour differential to the low carbon sources, you bring them on with very low disruption. Over time, as more and more of those new low carbon sources come online, you have to give a wider subsidy. You raise that lower tax up, but that pushes up the price that consumers are anyway paying for their energy, and it means that you can also pull down slightly the cents per kilowatt hour that you're subsidizing the new producers coming online. And you create essentially a rolling system. And I've illustrated it here, I won't go into detail, but you phase in over a 40 year period, mind you, four cents per kilowatt hour on the energy bill. Can't make it softer than that. And over time, that ends up raising the energy bill uh, by uh, total in the year uh, 2050, 
by about 0.7 of 1% of GNP, according to this calculation. Now, it may be that the technologies get even better of these renewables and they compete on their own. It could be that, as a recent article in Nature magazine had it two weeks ago, maybe we've overestimated. This is not exactly easy news. It's not great news, but it changes the calculation. Maybe we've overestimated the amount of coal that's under the ground. And rather than actually having fairly unlimited supplies of coal just enough to wreck the planet at a low price, maybe the coal is actually going to rise in price and rise right past the price of solar and wind and so on, so you wouldn't need any subsidies at all. We'd just be led to these alternatives by the market without even needing to take into account the externality of climate change destruction. Whichever it is, my point is that we, at a quite low price, can make this transition. It is essentially a technology transition. It's essentially based on the idea of mass electrification of autos and of buildings, and then converting the electricity itself to a clean grid. Those are the two essential steps of this. Electricity is the fuel carrier, and the primary energy converts either to carbon capture and sequestration or to a zero or low carbon energy source. And some of the best technologies combine natural gas with wind or combine natural gas with solar. You want to make that combination because of the intermittency of the renewables themselves. The costs are completely manageable. But we've never seen a plan. And this, I really do fault the administration for. Instead of a plan, they went to congressional negotiations. They went to the back room. They went to the lobbyists. They said, if we give you this many permits, if we do this and that, will you come on board? And it was a pretty awful process. Most of you were not watching it as closely as the process of health care, which was another awful process in terms of how the lobbyists swarmed around the system. Rather than having a plan with a logic, we had, unfortunately, the way we do it, a scrum, and ended up partly with a mess. And on energy, we didn't even end up with a mess. We ended up with a mess that was passed in one house uh, and was uh, defeated in the other house, but we never saw a plan. And this, I think, is absolutely missing. Not that you can plan from here to 2050, but you can certainly bound a strategy, and you can certainly use a plan to say, what should we do from here to 2020? And then we'll recalibrate along the way what's called adaptive programming. But we haven't even started to do that. We went for a cumbersome cap-and-trade system which is a bit of a mess on many counts, rather than a s simpler, gradually rising, transparent carbon tax. Because supposedly the lesson was learned in 1993 when President Clinton tried to put in a BTU tax, never mentioned the word tax. That may be true. We do have part of the electorate which is completely obsessively, uh, and I use the word advisedly, uh, against us paying for our most minimal needs, and our most urgent needs, I should say. But the fact of the matter is uh, the cap and trade was immediately branded a tax, which it implicitly was, and it was the end of it anyway. And it was a much less, uh, 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 much less a direct way to get where we needed to go. Obviously, we would need a gradual phase in of subsidies as new producers come online, and that's why the actual budget outlays can be pushed to the future, but paid for by an identified gradually rising tax. We need a lot of research and development. I don't have time to elaborate on this today because we don't actually know a lot of what needs to be known. How will carbon capture and sequestration work? How will the Chevy Volt operate? How will batteries improve in the future? How can a national grid
be properly and robustly managed when it relies on not the base load of coal, but a much higher proportion of wind and solar and other intermittent, uh, other intermittent sources. I'm told by all of my engineering colleagues that we just don't know the answers to these things. They are knowable, but they're not known. And we're certainly going to need a broad mix of technologies. Anyone that rules out a major category probably has to think again. Sad to say, we're going to need nuclear, and it's sad to say because it's a big problem in this world. Uh, and the risks of example proliferation politics are real, but it is also a low carbon energy source that dozens of countries will use uh, for their electricity, and that the United States is going to need and, con and continue to use. And we're probably going to need carbon capture and sequestration, clean coal, another of those tag words. Now there's another fight brewing which is uh, about the natural gas deposits and the hydrofracking so-called uh, of uh, blasting out of the shale rock of the Marcellus uh, shale underneath uh, New York and Pennsylvania, massive deposits, whether this can be done ecologically uh, soundly or not. Nothing is assured in any of this. Everything has to be done adaptively. The only thing that unfortunately is assured is that the current course is a course of disaster and a disaster that's already underway. We start today in Cancun. There will be no agreement. Maybe next year. But it's a very odd process. It's basically the wrong people at the negotiating table. It's very nice diplomats. I love diplomats. When they're good, they keep us out of war. But they are not good engineers. They don't design systems. They certainly don't design physical and technological systems. They don't understand the economics. And they don't know how to get us started. And unfortunately, these negotiations have kept the business sector away and kept the analytical and the academic sector away. And so we don't have negotiations over the things that we need to be negotiating on. I think the kind of framework that I very loosely sketched of how to converge in 2050 to a one-sixth uh, emission standard is actually a basis for discussion, a kind of convergence of technologies. And I think that China and India and other low-income countries right now accept the fact that they want to converge on incomes and that they would also have to converge on technological standards. And how to do that and who to pay for some of the extra costs are valid issues of negotiation. But focusing on how to make that convergence process work, I believe, is the right way to negotiate, but we're not there yet at all. And we've simply not cast these negotiations in the context of technology. Now, finally, let me turn back to us here. These are the numbers from the most recent Pew Center survey on American attitudes towards climate change. They're horrifying. What's happening to us? We're a weird place. We're in a complete anti-science rant right now. And it's getting worse. Since climate change has been big news uh, in the recent years, the numbers of people who believe that there's evidence for it has fallen sharply, down from 50% who believe that there is human-induced climate change in the 19, 2000, uh, sorry, 2006 poll to just 34% last month. So well over half of the American people either believe this is a natural process for which the scientists have looked up and down at changes of uh, solar radiation uh, and uh, every other kind of process so that could conceivably be part of this can't find those fingerprints. 
or that it's not happening at all. In the lower left-hand uh, part of the chart, you see the answers by political party. Only 16% of Republican respondents said that there's human-induced climate change. We're in an, ex an extraordinary moment when a really life and death issue for the planet has become a completely partisan issue as well, and where beliefs on the basic facts are so profoundly different across the divides. So 53% of Democrats, 16% of Republicans, and the independents right in the middle at 32%. And among our newly ascendant Tea Party, it's 8%. 8% of those who, among the Republicans who said that they agreed with the Tea Party, also said that there's human-induced climate change. What's happening here? It's really hard to know. Of course, it is true you can get 25% of Americans to agree on any proposition you can name. Uh, and so there is uh, something uh, to that. But the aggressive anti-science that we're living in right now is not entirely an accident. I have seen over the recent years, and many of us in academia feel it, the most relentless assault on science that I certainly recall in my professional lifetime. And it's led by identifiable uh, and powerful interests that are doing a profound disservice to the planet. Number one, Rupert Murdoch. Definitely the most destructive individual on this issue and many others in the world because he commands the media in a way that almost no other person on the planet does. I don't know whether he's simply the most cynical or ignorant, but somehow he is the most destructive. Sometimes I believe the Wall Street Journal editorial page is just designed to get my blood going in the morning because my wife knows that I'm absolutely bouncing off the walls every morning by about 6 a.m. out of control. So it's morning exercise. But it actually has a very powerful effect. David Koch, who some of you may have read about in The New Yorker earlier this year, the owner of, the, of America's largest uh, largest uh, um, privately owned oil and gas company, Coke Industries. Big philanthropist in New York. You go to Lincoln Center, you go to Coke Theater. You go to the American Natural History Museum, you go to the Coke Exhibition. More destruction of financing anti-scientific propaganda than perhaps any other person other than Rupert Murdoch himself. And this stuff works in today's age. And we're facing something more than problems of communication, uh, more than problems of uh, what was called climate gate last year of uh, injudicious uh, statements by a few climate scientists that I can assure you had absolutely zero to do with the climate science and with its uh, with its reliability, uh, its depth, its knowledge, but it was taken on as a massive campaign by the Wall Street Journal, who every day wrote the most vicious nonsense, saying that uh, not only was climate science wrong, but it was a deliberate, global, scientific hoax and fraud and conspiracy by all of those climate scientists looking to get rich on their government grants. And I kid you not. Uh, and as one who uh, tries to help keep these people uh, able to do their marvelous uh, research, they're not in it for the bucks, I can tell you. They are in it because they know that 
not only is the science uh, fascinating and deep, but the stakes could not be higher. And for us, ladies and gentlemen, the stakes that we have as citizens now to get our country reoriented in the right direction could also not be higher. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, both a sober and passionate um, assessment and a concrete policy analysis and proposal. Um, we are very short of time, but we are going to take just two questions, and I'm going to ask um, for one from each side. Uh, and if you could say the questions, and then we'll turn back to Jeff for a quick response, that would be great. So um, perhaps one on each side first. Here? Yeah, please, please. please. Um, yes, hi, Jeff. Um, I'm Mary Albertson. I'm from Results Global Group in the area, and I want to thank you for your friendship and your support to Results. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was if you would please comment on the importance of investments like a global fund for education and why this is doable and needed even in this economy for educating the people. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's take one more. Yeah. Uh, thank you also for a lucid and enlightening talk. You've talked much about the quantitative needs for more energy to meet economic growth and human aspirations, primarily using the first law of thermodynamics, that is talking about X number of kilowatt hours or BTUs to do that work. Yet, as we give up oil, natural gas, coal, we're going to energy that's much less intensive, uh, much less power packed than those fuels. We're going to the very gentle uh, harvesting of solar and wind and so on, which means that we're probably not only going to have to increase uh, our effort, but also change our lifestyles to solve problems that lower temperature energy sources can do, like living closer together, giving up the American dream of sprawl and living in cities where we can walk, use transit, and bicycle. You, could you comment on that? Sure. So uh, first, uh, on, uh, on the question about uh, Global Fund for Education, and uh, I want to first thank Results uh, International, uh, which is a marvelous, marvelous uh, organization uh, which mobilizes uh, public awareness for purposes of global sustainable development, and I love everything that Results does. I didn't talk about problems of poverty per se, but what this chart shows is, uh, I think, uh, perhaps useful very briefly. The red triangles are conflict areas, and the uh, yellow on the map are drylands. And what's happening, the uh, point that I'm making, this is taken from uh, a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called Commonwealth, is that the ecological stresses of the poorest places, the drylands, are spilling over into massive conflict. And we're fighting in places like Afghanistan, or Yemen, or Somalia, or Sudan, not by accident, but because people are hungry, desperate, poor, and therefore those places become vulnerable to terror, or to internal conflict, or to demagoguery and extremism and the like. We are spending an unbelievable waste of our resources, fighting this condition through military means, which is useless. Because <laughs> the problems are poverty. And we spend in Afghanistan $100 billion a year right now, and one hundredth of that on the poverty problems in Afghanistan and we go out of our way, we don't care about Afghanistan, this is just about Al-Qaeda. It's mind-boggling how ignorant this process is. We're just really in the hands of the military, I'm sorry to say. And if you read Bob Woodward's book uh, on Obama's war, you can't find one sentence in the whole book of anybody that says one word about Afghanistan's real life conditions, even though What's mentioned a hundred times by these generals is winning the hearts and minds. They don't have a clue 
as to the hearts and minds, not a clue, because the poverty, the hunger, the water stress, the ecological stress isn't mentioned one sentence in the entire book. And this is our disaster. So why do we need a global fund for education or a global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria? Or uh, help to uh, make sure that girls can stay in secondary school, which is one of the things that such a global fund would do, or help for smallholder farmers to grow more crops. First, it would save lives. Second, it might uh, save our souls. And third, it would be by far the most reliable way to peace on the planet. And climate change is going to make all of this dreadfully worse because it's the poorest people who almost inherently, not inherently, but by dint of history are, part, are poor in part because they're living in marginalized places that are already very difficult and therefore more vulnerable to the kinds of dislocations uh, that are likely to come. Second question was about the lifestyle changes and how we can manage uh, on this. I think there are a couple of things to say. First, let me make a technical point that uh, solar power is very diffuse, but there's potentially a lot of land available. This is one way that the deserts really can fulfill a tremendous direct human need at very, very low ecological price. And uh, as many of you have seen the little square in the Sahara which collects enough solar radiation to fuel the entire world. This is not fanciful uh, that our Mojave Desert or the Sahara or uh, the uh, Atacama Desert uh, in uh, Chile and Peru and so forth or the Gobi uh, or the uh, Taklamakan uh, or the Tar Desert in India could actually become places for major collection of solar radiation. Yes, very, very large arrays brought to people living in cities. I think it's a pretty interesting way to go when there's something called Desert Tech and Desert Tech Foundation, which is looking to mobilize the deserts uh, for uh, solar energy on a very large scale, and I find it a very exciting thing. Now, lifestyle changes uh, absolutely uh, are part of I think any kind of improvement uh, in our quality of life, uh, aside from uh, our environmental sustainability. Um, we're finding that the way we've designed sprawl, the way we've designed our cities without walking, uh, the way that uh, our uh, landscape uh, has uh, led to more flooding uh, and less uh, percolation of rainfall, uh, less uh, more surface runoff and so forth, provokes major hazards for us, major health risks, uh, and I think uh, major uh, problems of our own uh, psyches right now. Um, one of the interesting things about economic growth uh, that economists uh, have understood since uh, Richard Easterlin at University of Pennsylvania brought the fact to our attention uh, more than 30 years ago is that after a certain point, this chase for higher incomes is not leading to higher self-reported happiness or satisfaction. Uh, and uh, what economists now technically call uh, um, SWB, uh, 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 subjective well-being in, in uh, the opinion surveys. Uh, and it's actually quite stark. You get big gains when you're poor. They are real gains. I can tell you living with electricity rather than living without it, it's huge. Uh, it's huge. It keeps you alive. It allows you to have uh, uh, a uh, quality of life that we forget what, what uh, happens uh, without it, perhaps. Uh, but after a point, and we've certainly reached the point that the statistics show, it's very hard to find uh, much benefit directly from per capita income per se, as opposed to better health, more longevity. But that's not necessarily coming from a higher GNP per capita. That's coming from a smarter lifestyle, a better way to live, walking rather than driving every place, and so on. 
And so I could only say amen in general that there are many things that cities uh, and dense settlements actually do very, very well. New York City's CO2 footprint per capita is one-fourth of the national average. You can see why people walk, buildings, uh, your, your building heats the next building because uh, you're all interconnected down the, the long blocks of, uh, uh, of uh, the row houses or the, the brownstones. And it shows up very much uh, in, in the results. So these kinds of changes no doubt are part of what I call the energy efficiency, getting more for less and, getting, and being happier uh, as a result of it as well. And I think that there's a lot of that kind of learning and introspection to do. We are absolutely on what uh, the psychologists call the hedonic treadmill right now. We are running so fast, we're completely frenzied. And why we're doing it and what we think we're getting out of it really is a huge question, but a question for another lecture. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we certainly got a lot more, and we appreciate all of your insights and comments. Thank you, all of you, for joining us this afternoon. There are, I think, uh, some refreshments and hopefully conversation in the lobby, and I invite you to stay and continue your discussion. Thanks again for joining us. <laughs>